So there's mine. So there's the corner of the room right there. I came out half the distance on the first square, which is one foot, and then I went another half of that, which was one quarter, which is a half, a foot and a half, which gave me this edge right here. Gave me that point. I then drew up the wall to a five foot height. There's four feet right there. There's six feet right there. So half the distance between this line here and this line here is five feet. To the vanishing point, drew my back line across here. It's two feet deep, so I came across again from this point here, one and a half feet to there. Straight line up, gave me my back edge. My next option, I've gone up and down, I've gone to the vanishing point. My next option is to go parallel to the horizon line. So I draw the top front edge and the bottom front edge. Extend them out. I find the distance, half the distance between here and here is one foot to the vanishing point. Gives me my leading edge here. Same thing across here. Where that bisects this point here, I simply draw my line straight up and ta-da, I'm done. Twelve lines, my bookshelf is finished. Three directions. Now what I want you to do is I want you to draw a two foot square cube and I want that cube to be let's see, two, four, eight feet away from this back corner here and one foot away from this wall here. Okay. So eight feet from here forward and one foot from this wall here out here. And it's a two foot square cube. So I'll step through it with you this time. Here's my back corner. I said eight feet. Two, four, six, eight. And one foot out puts the one corner right there at that point. So all I have to do is just draw a dot right there. From my vanishing point, I extend my line across two feet to the next line there. It's two feet this way, so that means I have to go half the distance here, because I went half the distance here for one foot. That's one foot. Another foot is two feet, so that gives me the width there. So from the halfway point here, I now go back to my vanishing point. So now I've got the square of the bottom surface of my cube. So again, it's connect the dots. I've got four dots now, four corners that I've created. I've got a sheet of wood that's the bottom face of the box. I've got four corners. I've got three choices. One is to go parallel to the horizon line, which I've already done. The next is to go to the vanishing point, which I've already done. The only other choice I have now is to go straight up and down vertical. So from each of the corners, I draw a line straight up and down vertical. Draw a line up like that. Another one like that. One over here. And one over here. So, based on my measurement grid, this is two feet this direction, this is two feet deep, how do I know where to end these lines off here? How do I know where my height has to go? What do I use? The wall. The wall. I use my wall. There's my two foot height right there. So, I project my line across here. This is the front edge of the box along the floor. It continues across this line and bonk, I hit a wall. Now I got to go up. So I go up to this point here. And again, you only have three choices as to which direction your line can go in. It's already going vertical. There's a line that's already going to the vanishing point. So the next choice that I have from this point here is to do a horizontal line. So I take from that corner a line going horizontally. 
I'm not going to draw it out in space because I know it's got to touch this corner here which is the leading corner of the box and extend across to this line here which is the other corner of the box. That's the front face of my box now. I've now introduced two new corners, a corner here and a corner here. Choices are straight up and down, I've already done that. Parallel to the horizon line, I've already done it. So my only other choice from this point is to go back to the vanishing point. Back to the vanishing point. In this corner here, same thing. I've already gone straight up and down. I've already gone parallel to the horizon line. I have to go back to the vanishing point. That's the side top edge corner. So where the back edge now, this corner here touches that point, that's the back corner. Where this one over here touches that corner, that's the back corner there. And those two lines now go parallel to each other, which just coincidentally happen to go through this point on the wall, which is the two foot point in. So those lines will automatically connect together. That now gives me my two foot square cube one foot away from the box and eight feet away from the back wall. So you can see how your coordinates on your grid system on your wall can let you place anything accurately anywhere you want within the room. Right down to the exact inches if you wanted to. If you wanted to subdivide each of those by inches you could do it precisely. So if someone gave you a floor plan of a room and said can you draw this three-dimensionally so I can see what it would look like if I was standing at six feet tall, here's the process that you would use. This exact same process based on the dimensions of the room using measurements. As soon as you say whatever this point from here to here on your corner of your room, as soon as you give that a number and say it's a specific height, everything else falls into place. Whatever it is, you just have to subdivide it by the number of feet that you've said it is, or inches that you've said it is. And then everything has to work proportionately. So if you, I've said that this is eight feet from here to here, if I only wanted this wall to be six foot feet wide, then I would stop my wall right here. Two, four, six. That would be the edge of the wall, and this would be the ceiling line, and this would be the floor. And my grid would then come out from that point. Or if I wanted to extend the wall out to 10 feet, I'd add on another two inches or two feet here with the grid, and my corner of my room would extend out from there. Okay, you get the idea? So it's just a pure mathematical measurement system and eyeballing it to make sure that it visually looks correct. If something doesn't look right, you make the correction to it. Okay? So now what we're going to do is we're just going to add on one little thing. We're going to go back to what we did the very first class. We're going to put a two-point perspective box inside of this room now. Right. So what I want you to do Again, whoops, I'll just step you through this. We're going to take, let's use this point right here. This point right here is the center of the box. So if we're looking at the box from above, there's a box. We're going to make it a two, two foot square box. What we need to do is we need to bisect the corners like this because we're going to look at it in two-point perspective, which means our point of view is not looking at it this way. Our point of view is looking at it this way. And so we need to know where these two lines here are on our grid. And those two lines are this line and this line right here. So this center point right here is this center point of our box. That's where we're going to line up the center of our box, right there. Okay. So if that's the case then, what we need to do, ouch, cramp, got a muscle cramp. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to find our vanishing points on either side of our drawing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick, and remember last week I told you when you're dealing with this type of a drawing here, if you've got 11 by 17, you can arbitrarily choose a vanishing point that's approximately two inches off the page on either side. Okay, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to make a vanishing point roughly about two inches. I'm just going to draw it on my plastic here and slide it over so you can sort of see it. See it right there? Okay. There it is there. Actually what I'll do is I'll just use this uh, dry erase marker here just to make it. 
more obvious. There's my one point there. And on the other side over here, I'm going to place my other point right about there. Okay, so those will be just off the edge of my field of vision, but I can use it for reference. You can do the same thing with your own page. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go from that vanishing point of there. Actually, let me just slide it so you can see it. So I'm going to go from the vanishing point that's there through my center point, like this. And then from the other vanishing point on the opposing side here, through the center point, like that. Okay, and that gives me my grid for where my lines are going. So I've got this. That now gives me these lines here. Okay. So that I can now rotate my box properly. So if this is the front edge, like if this is two feet here and I want to go half the distance here, then essentially what I'm going to do is I'm just going to sort of loop my line around to this point here. That point right there would be approximately one foot in perspective. So I'm just going to go to the vanishing point over here, draw a line through like this. And from where that touches the center point there, because this is a two, pure two point perspective, I'm going to go from that intersection point there through to my vanishing point over here. That's going to extend back like that. This point is now going to be my other corner on the opposite side. And the same thing from here to that point, crisscross like that. So now all I have to do is just extend my lines up because I've gone my two vanishing points. My next option is to go straight up and down. So this center line is already established through there, which is the leading corner and the back corner of the box. So I've got to make sure that this is parallel here. So this is going to go straight up and down. And straight up and down on this side here. So I'm looking for lines that are close to, so I can match them up. Okay, so this is the leading edge that's closest to me, right through the center there. So let's say that this box now is, let's say it's a foot and a half tall. Okay, so this is two feet tall here. So I'm going to project from this corner here to the wall up to here. That's two feet. So I want to go a foot and a half. So half the distance is one foot. Half the distance of that is one and a half feet. So now from this point, I project a line parallel to the horizon line across until it touches this point right here. And that's the corner of the top of the box there. So from this corner, I go through my vanishing point on the side here. And that creates that front plane there. So now again, it's connect the dots. I've got a point there and a point there. I've already gone to the vanishing point there. I've already gone straight up and down. My only other choice is to go to this vanishing point over here. So I'll complete the front edge of this box, or this plane that's here, like that. And then the back edge goes back to that center line there. And then these two points here will automatically connect through to the vanishing point that's here, if I'm accurate with it. See how they line up now? Okay, so that way I know that I've done the right thing. So you can look at the plane that's on the top here. You can actually measure the distance from here to here, and it will be less than the distance from here to here. It's because this edge here is closer to my horizon line, as this box, if I extend this box higher and higher, this plane is going to rotate until it gets parallel to the horizon line, then it flattens out. Okay. So that gives me an accuracy to double check to see whether or not it looks correct. So I can do the same thing. I can place any type of a box anywhere within the room. 
just based on where I wanted to put. Okay. So using a measuring system like a grid is very, very helpful. And so I just wanted to introduce you to that idea because later on we're going to be doing an assignment where I actually am going to give you a floor plan. And it'll just be a floor plan and I'll say this is the height of the ceiling, go. And everything that's within that room, you've got to figure out what the height of it is. So here's where, from this point on, within your lives, you have to become observationists. You have to start looking around at things, but not just on a casual basis. It's not like you're walking down the street and go, hey, there's a car. Oh, there's a fire hydrant. Oh, there's a whatever, okay? A mailbox. You need to know how big are these things. Because at some point in time, you may be asked to draw a street scene, and within this street scene, you might have to draw a curb, a mailbox, and a phone booth. How big are those things? Do you guys know how big a phone booth is? Do you know what the measurements of a phone booth are? Nobody, nobody here knows what the size of a phone booth is. So what would you have to do? You have to go out with your ruler and measure it. Take a measuring tape and measure the whole thing. Find out what the dimensions of it are so that you can accurately portray that. Okay. So you need to start observing things. So when I ask you to draw this room, there are going to be specific elements that are within the room. It's like a, an apartment. And in the room is going to be a couch. And the couch is going to have three cushions on it. There's going to be a coffee table. There's going to be two side tables. There's going to be lamps on each of the table. There's going to be a table that's right by the front door that you stick your keys on. There's going to be doors. There's going to be a closet door, a main door. There's going to be a bookshelf. There's going to be a single seat that matches the couch that's on the opposite side of the room with a table beside it and a lamp on it. And there's going to be a rug on the floor. And so you're going to have to use the floor plan to spatially relate things together and say this is how far they are away from each other and the distance and actual measurements. And then you're going to have to figure out how high is a couch. Now you can use whatever kind of a couch you want. You can use your couch that's at home in place of this, just so long as it's the proper width and the proper depth. Okay? But you can make it whatever height you want. But these are things that you're going to have to start measuring and figuring out. Later on, we're going to do an environment that has a set of stairs in it. How many people know what the riser height of a stair is? What's the standard riser height? Anybody know? Nobody knows? Go out and measure it. What's the depth of a stair? The depth and the height of the riser are not the same. What's the height of a railing? These are all things that you're going to have to determine so that when I give you a room and I say this room is eight feet high, does anybody here know how many steps it takes to go from one floor to another floor when the ceiling is eight feet high? Anybody know the number of steps? <coughs> no? <Nine>. No? <laughs> Twelve. <Okay. laughs> Process of elimination. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Ding! Got it. <laughs> of course, if you were given a room and I said I want you to put a stairs set of stairs in there, and you put in two stairs, don't you think that would look kind of weird? Right? Because each step would be four feet high. That's not logical. Right? So you would have to subdivide the height to the proper height that the character can actually lift their feet for, and that depends on the character as well. If you've got a cartoony character he might require different size stairs. Like let's say we're dealing with the uh, Lord of the Rings. And what's the big magician's name? Gandalf. You bunch of geeks. <laughs> so it's Gandalf. <laughs> His house is different than, what's the name of the hobbit? Frodo. Frodo. Geeks. <laughs> the height of their houses are different. Remember when he's inside the house, he has to crouch down. So the height of the stairs for Gandalf would be different than the height of the stairs for, for Frodo. Okay? It depends on who your character is and what their scale and proportion is. will require them to have a different scale to their house as well. So these are things that you need to understand. Now when it gets to larger numbers of things, like how many, who knows how many piano keys there are on a piano, standard piano? 88. There's 88 keys on a piano. 
So do you think if you drew a piano with all the keys showing, if you drew 77, that anybody would go, hey, that piano's wrong, it's only got 77 keys, there should be, seven, there should be 88. Think anybody's gonna notice that? Maybe. No, because there's a bunch of keys and you look at it and it's got the icon of a piano with black and white keys and you go, that's a piano. And you either accept the fact that it's got a lot of keys without counting it and you go, yeah, that's right. But if it's only got two keys on it, you're gonna go, that's not right. Uh, only it depends because there are there are two balancing factors that you have to consider whenever you're setting up a shot. What's your focal point? If your focal point is the character, and the character is the main part of the scene, then what part of the character are you going to be looking at when you're watching them on screen? Head. What part? Head. What part? Eyes. Oh, eyes. You're going to be looking directly at their eyes to see what their emotional context is. Okay. You're going to be tracking where their eyes are going. What's in the background is just dressing. It's to say, oh, that's where they are within the relationship of the room. Okay, so if you see a clock on the wall behind the character in one scene, and then all of a sudden when you cut back to that character, there's no clock there, your brain goes, the character moved. They're in a different position within the room. Okay? So the fact that there's 88 keys on a piano or 77 keys on a piano is irrelevant because you're focusing on the character, not on the piano keys. And even if you were focusing on the piano, like let's say someone was playing the piano, and you had a close-up on the piano keys, there's too many keys for someone to go, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, blah, 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 blah. there's only 77 keys on the piano! How dare you assault my intelligence by only putting 77 on there? There should be 88. I reject this film. <laughs> okay. You don't do that. If you do, you got a problem. <laughs> So we don't worry about stuff like that to that extent, right? But if in this, within this room that we're drawing here, if we've established that there are three square objects here, or three boxes, one is the shelf, one is this two foot by two foot square, and the other one is this box that's on an angle, if you start sliding those things around from one shot to the next, if in the next shot we're over here looking in this direction towards the bookshelf, and this box is now suddenly right beside it, your brain's gonna go, How'd that box get over there? Did it come alive and move? And if it's an instantaneous cut from one scene to the other, you're, you're gonna reject it and you're gonna go, that makes no sense. That's wrong. One of these things just doesn't belong here. And that box should not be there. Okay, so there's continuity that we have to be considering. All right. So that's why understanding the placement of your objects is important. Now, later on when you guys get into the 3D aspect of it, I mean, you're going, to be, you're going to be creating environments that are like this. I mean, does that not look like a, a computer set up in 3D Studio Max with all your NURBS and polygons? It creates a grid system around your boxes, right? So if you created these boxes in 3D space, you would have a grid that defined the box for the room. You would create a polygon that was this bookshelf over here and a polygon that was this object here and a polygon that was there. You would rotate it, set it into space, and boom, you're done. All you got to move is move move your camera around within that space and you're guaranteed that nothing is going to move but there may be instances when just as in a live action set you're going to want to move your camera into a certain position and there's something that's in your way and you got to move it to get it out of the way or you might have to slide it a little bit in order to bring it more into the foreground properly and give your characters room so you can play around with stuff to a certain extent you just can't move it to the opposite side of the room all of a sudden but these are elements that you're going to have to deal with later on. We're just dealing with them on paper now. And this is part of your planning stage. Okay. The amount of time that it took us to draw this drawing here, to actually build that in 3D, would take you a little bit longer. Okay. And even if you were to take it to the full extent of actually turning these things into what the objects actually are and putting details and textures onto it, you can still describe the shot from this point of view in about five minutes compared to the hours that it's going to take you to set everything up and put it in its proper place. So we have to understand the basic elements of how to do this very quickly and efficiently and accurately on paper first before we can then translate it over. Okay? So you can take this information and think about it over the next week. I'm not going to ask you to hand anything.